So welcome everybody to the PICE at LDI um, visiting professor series. My name is Megan Lane Fall. I'm the executive director of PICE at LDI, which is the Penn Implementation Science Center at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics, which is quite a mouthful. We are delighted to have you here and delighted to welcome a visiting speaker that I'm going to introduce. So Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Public Health in the College of Science and Health at the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in Los Angeles, California. She also serves as the director of Party Rand Graduate School's Community Partnered Policy and Action Academic Stream. And Dr. Gonzalez is also a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leader. Dr. Gonzalez focuses her scholarship on the study of urban communities and community health. Her approach of finding local solutions to local problems in urban neighborhoods is rooted in social justice, critical engagement, and multidisciplinary scholarship. Dr. Gonzalez is the daughter of Mexican immigrants born and raised in Watts in Southern California. Her background informs her interest in developing place-based initiatives through community engagement and neighborhood assessments to improve the quality of life for low-income and racial and ethnic minority residents who live in under-resourced neighborhoods. She has developed partnerships between community, government, and academia through efforts like the Watts Community Studio and the Los Angeles Promise Zone Young Ethnographers, Pro Eth Ethnographers Program. I have known of Dr. Gonzalez and her work for several years, and I consider her to be a thought leader in research that centers the knowledge, strengths, needs, and perspectives of local communities, and we're thrilled to have her here. Her talk is entitled, If You're Not at the Table, You're on the Menu, Reflections on Participatory Engagement at the Intersection of Theory and Practice. So, Dr. Gonzalez, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, I am super stoked and excited to... Um, share some reflections on some of the work I've been doing over the last few years. Um, so I appreciate the ask um, and hopefully we can definitely uh, engage in critical dialogue. I'll uh, be speaking to some of the programs I've, I've led, um, some of the roles I've had and sort of really thinking through what informed the various work and the multiple hats um, uh, we wear. Um, and so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and start. That looks great. Um, yeah, so um, I, I will also uh, share with you all a few um, uh, comments and knowledge I've gained from a lot of the community partners I've worked with. And this this particular title of this presentation comes from one of my community partners here in Watts. Um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And oftentimes when we think about decision making, uh, opportunities um, made available to folks, um, it's important to be at the decision-making table and representation matters. Um, and that's one of the most critical uh, lessons I've learned in my bo both my personal and professional life. Um, and so I wanna honor him um, and, and our, our partnership and our work and really learning about how do we get more folks at the table. Um, as, I, as I shared um, about, about this quote, um, oftentimes folks add questions about why don't we change the table? Uh, why don't we design our own table? And then we get into very like detailed um, and engaging conversations about how participatory engagement can look like with this table analogy. So feel free to um, elevate that. Um, in, in my work, uh, we often have to reflect on our own position. Um, and how that shows up in the world, what we call positionality. Um, without sharing with you all, all of who I am, a taste of who I am, comes from being the daughter of uh, Mexican immigrants, a uh, first generation um, resident of Watts, uh, a mother of uh, toddler twin girls, um, and uh, really uh, someone committed to uh, uh, a community that that really informed my professional endeavors. Uh, so I greet, I salute you from Watts, uh, the neighborhood where I was born and raised, and now I'm deeply rooted in 
um, and trying to figure out um, how academia can be a resource and a lever for improving quality of life in the neighborhood. I'll be sharing a little bit about the neighborhood with you all. Um, I will say academia was my protective factor. I grew up in a neighborhood where dominant perspectives really lived in it. Um, I grew up in Watts when it was, you know, um, uh, you know, highly violent um, at the intersection of, I lived at the intersection of um, uh, gang territory and violence was very real. Um, bullets would go through my house when the gangs would meet up and shoot at each other. Um, cars were broken into and we found survival mechanisms to deal with what we were encountering. And for me, um, I assumed everyone grew up and lived in the ways I lived because I didn't think that there would have to be differences of, you know, um, access to opportunities um, based on where we live. Um, and so I didn't really learn that um, I was from Watts until I left for higher ed. Um, and books became a space for me to think critically about those differences. Why is it that, uh, you know, my own lived experience was very different than the folks I encountered in uh, to start at UCLA? Um, and so here I, I quote Bell Hooks and thinking that academia became a healing space for me, um, a way for me to think critically about my upbringing and the traumas associated to that and how to shift that and um, and really think about future generations um, in our communities. With that, I also don't want to commit to a dominant perspective of a violent, backward, underserved, under-resourced community. Um, that is not the narrative that I came across in Watts um, because of organizing, of community engagement, of advocacy, we've been able to have the resources we have in the neighborhood. Thanks to the 1965 uprisings, we have a hospital and we have a university and we have a bank. And, um, and so really it's not uh, other decision makers, but it's really folks on the ground that have worked tirelessly um, to get the resources to the neighborhood in the ways that they show up. Um, and I, you know, I would fail them to say that um, Watts is only that dominant narrative of a violent neighborhood with, you know, we insert all data of need informed uh, research. Um, but really, it has, it has these incredible assets and its people um, is the first of them all. Um, I also want to draw attention to the little bird you see where the arrow is pointing to. Um, it's an African proverb, an African image known as Sankofa. And as you can tell, the bird is looking back, really reminding us that in order to know where you're headed, you have to be connected to where you come from. Um, you also have to understand what has created your, um, your present. Um, and so we can't be disconnected from what has informed what, where we are and why we are where we are. Um, so I'll be sharing a little bit about that. So I've talked to you a little bit about what made me arrive at place-based efforts, really understanding that where I grew up um, had a significant contribution to the health outcomes that oftentimes we list. Um, data shows that in Watts, our life expectancy is 12 years less than uh, more affluent neighborhoods in the city. Um, and that's simply by living in the neighborhood, not taking into account any other demographics. Um, and so with that, we do understand that, you know, place is where people live, work, study, and play, and really impacts um, access to opportunity. And that then um, informs what our well-being and quality of life will look like. And we know that historically, our neighborhoods are not sort of an organic um, uh, space, but, they've act but policies have actually led us to create these segregated neighborhoods, these communities, of the haves and have nots and you know some some examples include jim crow redlining and racial covenants where depending on the color of your skin you were allowed or granted opportunities to you know purchase a home in a certain neighborhood or access certain opportunities um and oftentimes that led to the concentration of poverty that had an incredible um uh, impact on our well-being so 
I, I in, in thinking about uh, academia and research, um, again, another community partner of mine uses these particular images and I want to honor her, um, Dr. Loretta Jones. Um, she was the executive director of Healthy African American Families and one of the lead partners at some of the work I'll be sharing with you all at Drew. But she said, you know, intention and impact are not the same. And we need to understand that a history of research and traditional ways of doing work have impacted our communities. Um, and that trust is really difficult to gather. So it's going to require a lot of work and it's going to require partnership intentional partnership to be able to effect change um, that address the historical present. That is the histories that have created us, um, the inequities that have created us and where we are as a result of that, um, to repair the damages of, of poor decision-making. Um, and so uh, we, we, we know that a history of research has um, uh, disempowered communities, um, has sometimes violated uh, communities, uh, particular communities, right? So insert demographic here uh, when, when you think of the haves and have nots. Uh, and so in order to, to understand that better, there are uh, methods, approaches, frameworks in, in academic spaces that begin to try to level that playing field, that begin to address the complexities of what um, uh, unethical work and research has done. Um, you'll see that some of the frameworks I'll introduce with you all ha are, are highlighted in green, just so you understand where, where we're coming from, where, what, what, do, what, does, what do textbooks tell us and um, academic spaces. And so community-based participatory research became that space for me. How do I use my protective factor education to begin to understand and work with the communities that I'm interested in working with? Um, community-based participatory research really thinks about collaborative research where it recognizes the value in partnerships and the need for partnerships in the research process. Moving the researcher from the sort of our, our computer, our literature reviews, what is the data saying in our office space into uh, the lived experiences of communities um, and really working with the folks who know firsthand um, how to address the issues that they're encountering. Um, CBPR is rooted in principles of building community, of making sure that oftentimes, you know, when we do research, uh, we, we do our work and then we leave the community. We may not report back our findings. We may not enable a way for a community to build capacity based on the work that we're doing. And so CBPR also ensures that there is this, this um, balance between research and action. Um, and as much as uh, academia begins to publish in its ivory tower and sharing knowledge, there's a bi-directional exchange to ensuring that community also benefits from the knowledge that's being produced and they're actively involved in that production of knowledge. And so with that, I want to make sure to address that CBPR is not a method. Um, it's really an orientation. It, it, it has principles and a framework that guides us in thinking about how we want to do our research. Um, how do we want to do ethical research? How do we want to do intentional research, collaborative, partnered research that is bi-directional with our partners? Um, so it is complicated in that it involves a series of, of key stakeholders and players and building that relationship and building that trust is the first step um, before actually even planning a research uh, proposal, right? Um, and so that makes it a little more complicated. Uh, there's different ways we understand CBPR um, in community-engaged research. Uh, uh, CBPR also um, emerges from participatory action research. Um, it uh, Patient-centered outcomes research actually follows uh, CBPR principles. Community-engaged research now sort of is an umbrella of thinking about how we work um, with engaging communities. And uh, I mentioned Dr. Loretta Jones she called attention to CBPR and saying, we're not just community-based. We don't just go to a community um, and do work there, but we actually partner with community with our thought uh, partners in that. And so she uh, coined the term community partnered participatory research to draw attention to the um, principles of partnership. With that, this is the framework um, for CBPR. And um, in all of its um, complicated nature that you see here, it's really simple. It has four domains. 
um, there's this context, right? Understanding what we're trying to focus on and the key players, the key sort of um, uh, uh, concepts, structures, um, sort of a mapping of what what informs this particular issue area that we want to understand. Um, who are, you know, what, what are what are the uh, political players in it? Um, and and when thinking of a, a partnership, uh, what is the readiness by community and academic partners to become, uh, to engage in partnership? Um, once we understand context, we move into really thinking about a partnership dynamic, um, thinking about power differentials, um, you know, understanding capacity is understanding what are we able to do? What can our, you know, nonprofit partners do, our government partners do, our academic partners do? What can't they? What resources are necessary? Um, what do power differentials look like? Um, what are the dynamics that are informing the partnership? Um, and how can we move through that to design and implement an intervention or a research uh, proposal that takes into account these key players. So already context and partnerships have not arrived us at implementing our research uh, protocol. That, that fits into the intervention domain where once we've worked together, thought collectively about what the project is, uh, designed a proposal, then we implement um, and really think about its fit. Um, will it work in a particular community? Um, we don't parachute models. Um, you know, I'll share with you what we do in Watts, um, and we've done it in other neighborhoods. But these these programs have looked have looked distinctly different because neighborhoods differ. Um, conceptually, we can understand them, but in application, oftentimes they look different. Um, and so, with that, um, it's really important to understand fit um, and also understand um, what is the capacity building element of the partnership? What are the partners getting out of it? Um, and oftentimes our partners inform the research design. Um, and I, I'm gonna share stories with you all on sort of my, my lessons in Watts, but I will share one. Um, as a doctoral student, I didn't wanna assume I knew my neighborhood. I didn't wanna say, hey, I know Watts, I'm gonna make decisions, write proposals related to um, improving quality of life in Watts because I'm a resident and I know this, I, I grew up in the neighborhood. I actually wanted to hear from my neighbors. What are your priorities? What are you experiencing? And so here I am designing a dissertation proposal where I was gonna interview 200 residents by myself for two hours each. And the survey was about 12 pages. Um, and so, you know, thinking this was so ideal, residents are gonna participate. And what ended up happening was before I, this, this was sort of the draft of my proposal. And before actually doing that um, in partnership with our local city council, um, we ended up inviting um, partners, community-based uh, community organizations, nonprofits, uh, faith-based organizations, key leaders in the neighborhood. I think we identified like 80 different key players and agencies to come and hear about this assessment that I was gonna do in the neighborhood. We had about 40 folks show up. And when they looked at this proposal, they they were quick to tell me, this is not gonna work in Watson. I don't know what you're trying to do. Um, folks are gonna be completely turned off by it. Um, two hours of their time you have to consider. And they just gave me a list of these different considerations in the neighborhood. Um, and so with that, to make a long story short, that two hour, 12 page survey turned into a 15 minute self-administered three page survey that was co-designed with the folks that attended um, the, the session. Um, and then they ended up using the findings from the recommendations to train their staff, to apply for other grants. And I'll share more about that. But had it not been for asking them specifically, is does this work for this community in this particular way? I don't think we would have arrived at what we're calling now the Watts Community Studio. So our outcomes um, as our fourth domain really inform not only improving quality of life and insert sort of traditional research outcomes language here, but also how do we make sure that the folks um, who are in partnership are also ben benefiting from the knowledge that we're producing are also building capacity. So there's the level of sustainability if and when we leave um, the partnership or the work um, and the, the, another principle in CDPR is that 
it, it's a cyclical process. So we learn from each other these domains. It's not linear. Um, and so um, we we go back to the drawing board. So example of the, this 12 page, two hour interview, it wasn't it. So we had to go back um, and, and take some time um, to design something that would be effective to the community. Um, and, 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 and these four domains really lead in understanding that um, our research partnership is not about calling the organizations to be our outreach, uh, participant outreach sort of folks. They're our thought partners and they're involved in the entire process of planning, designing, implementing, and analyzing um, our research. Um, and so it's really important though, CBPR as a valuable model, oftentimes folks feel that, you know, oh, I'm just gonna call a nonprofit, get a letter of support. And if we get funded, they'll work with us, otherwise they won't. Um, and they'll, their role is going to be to outreach for participants. And that's not what CDPR is about. Um, I want to make sure that um, that's taken into account. It also takes um, into account power differentials um, and really talks about addressing uh, uh, inequities to achieve equity um, and arrive at social justice, meaning that folks um, can achieve well-being for all um, and having a common vision and, and values in that in that direction. So um, an example of what, what I ended up doing um, in Watts was go back to the drawing board, Cynthia, understand Watts. I became obsessed with understanding inner city neighborhoods, ghettoization, racialization of communities. Um, and um, my, my space became my community. Um, I wanna take you a little bit into Watts to understand how complex simply by design um, in that blue map of the United States you see there, um, you see a little red dot there in California. That is Los Angeles County. There are over 10 million people living in LA County. That is, if we compare the uh, population um, by state, uh, LA County ranks nine in US population rankings. There are more people living in that little red dot than each individual state in the US. So we are living on top of each other. Then we go into LA County. LA County is uh, divided into eight service planning areas, spas. Not to be confused with the self-care type of spas, but service planning areas. And the service planning areas are, are, also, are very regional. Um, service planning area six is where Watts sits. Um, service planning area has over a million residents in it, and it serves... Uh, three uh, cities, Compton, Paramount, and Linwood, and about five uh, neighborhoods in the city of LA. Quite complicated. That's simply LA County. <laughs> if we move to the, the lower uh, list of images, you also see LA County divided by city. There's about 88 cities within LA County, and the one in red there is the city of LA. Watts is not a city. Watts is a neighborhood in the city of LA. And in the city of LA is divided into 15 council districts. That um, um, Watts sits with council district 15, the one uh, circled in green. Um, and it, it sort of kind of hangs from the top um, where one side of Watts ends up being the, 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 the east side of Watts ends up being um, Linwood City, uh, Southgate, uh, these are two cities that share boundaries with Watts. The south end of Watts um, uh, shares a boundary with Willowbrook, an unincorporated, un unincorporated neighborhood in LA County. Um, that means that it's not a city. Willowbrook uh, is actually a neighborhood in LA County. They don't have a mayor or city council person and they go to their uh, LA County supervisorial district to, to access resources and opportunities. And the north um, and west side of Watts ends up being our historic South Central, um, Los Angeles. So Watts doesn't sit in a, in a, in a South, uh, historic South Central Council District uh, uh, space. It actually sits in Council District 15. And Council District 15 is actually the most disparate district in the city um, because on the South end, you have the port and you have uh, San Pedro um, where there's you know a um, uh, uh, affluent community, uh, opportunities for employment, the port, and sort of the um, transportations of goods and services from the port to downtown LA. And then on the north end of the, the district, you see more of the 
uh, communities that struggle um, with access to resources and opportunities. And so it, it ends up being um, a task for the elected official to really address these disparate needs, um, but also thinking about the assets of um, having the port as an asset. Um, and also um, in, in thinking about demographics, the median age for Watts is 24, approximately 25 years old. Um, and that means that we're quite young. Um, and it's a neighborhood of families. Um, so it's also really important to address that not, you know, not only uh, do we struggle with having, you know, um, uh, uh, quality educational attainment, um, and uh, we are in the epicenter of poor environmental uh, outcomes or exposures, um, and we have a significant amount of chronic health outcomes and premature deaths related to homicides but we're also really young um, and we're also a community of families. Um, and we still uh, speak to our neighbors and we still engage um, in collective ways of being. Um, and so putting these sort of narratives together is really essential to beginning to understand loss. With that, um, we also need to understand what created the neighborhood um, in uh, up until the mid uh, 1800s, uh, Watts was part of Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, ended the U.S.-Mexico War, which led to, you know, the uh, Southwestern United States uh, being, the now Southwestern United States being part of the U.S. Um, and Watts was, um, a, was a land, um, uh, was a land grant of, an, um, known as Rancho La Cajuata. Um, it was, um, it was a you know a traditional uh, farming community, um, and a lot of what ended up happening once the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed that a lot of farmers were asked to submit their paperwork to the courts to um, sort of legitimize them, and oftentimes their properties were stolen by lawyers um, and documents written in Spanish that were not understood in the English language, um, and that ended up being some of the narrative for Watts. Um, as part of La Rancho La Tajuata, um, it was a labor camp uh, for the uh, Pacific Electric Railway. So if you come to Watts, it, right in the middle of it, there's a railroad that splits the neighborhood. Um, and it goes from the port to downtown LA. Um, and now we also have a metro rail in the neighborhood. Um, and in the 1900s, it was a thriving community that brought workers interested in um, uh, building the, the railway. Um, considering the, the changes in the neighborhood in the 20s, Watts became part of the city of LA. It was its own city with a mayor. Um, and considering the, the resources, the, the fact that the, the railway was in the middle of the neighborhood and such, um, it became part of LA. And we saw a concentration of public housing uh, emerge. In the neighborhood, at each corner of the neighborhood, there's a, a affordable housing, a public housing space. Um, so there's four public housing sites in a 2.12 square mile neighborhood. Um, and uh, Black folks immigrating uh, from uh, escaping Jim Crow South um, and um, ended up concentrating a lot of uh, um, living in Watts largely because of what I mentioned, racial covenants and uh, redlining where folks were, were um, granted uh, loans specifically to certain neighborhoods. Um, so as black folks are immigrating to LA, they're concentrating in Watts and white flight occurred um, simply by, uh, a, a, as a white family owning a house, simply by living next to a black family, the value of your home would reduce. Talk about racism, for public policy. Um, and so white flight uh, was highly informed by racist practices and um, ideations. Um, once you know poverty is concentrated, we do see uh, an impact on quality of life and well-being. And so um, you know, police brutality, access to uh, goods and, and services was very limited in the neighborhood. Um, and as a call to action, the 1965 Watts uprisings um, emerged. Uh, really where, neighbor, where communities and residents were asking for an improved quality of life and access to basic resources. 
um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit on the history, but um, Watts is, is known also for um, the crack cocaine epidemic where um, at that time, uh, NAFTA and CAFTA were signed, where we opened up uh, trade uh, internationally, businesses left the neighborhood, unemployment increased, um, and crack cocaine was introduced into the neighborhood uh, and really impacted well-being. Um, we also saw uh, revolutionary wars in Central America <laughs> that led Latino communities to immigrate from their countries into the U.S., particularly a lot of Latinos finding home in South L.A. in Watts. Um, and so we started seeing a predominantly, you know, Black community uh, pushed out uh, by violence, crack cocaine epidemic, um, vouchers to move into other um, neighborhoods, and Latinos seeking safety from the violence of their own countries and moving into um, into neighborhoods like Watts. Um, and so they call it a, the demographic shift, where we moved from being predominantly Black to Latino. Um, I mentioned the uh, 1965 uprisings um, to note that they're known as the Watts riots. But if you see this map, this actually includes a larger part of LA, all the way to downtown LA and all the way south to, to Compton. Um, and that little star you see there is essentially where um, uh, Watts is located. Um, and so really, um, the 1965 uprisings were known as the um, Los Angeles riots and at some point in time shifted to being um, the Watts riot. And that, that really changes the narrative of how we understand a neighborhood. So uh, to understand what happened in 1965, um, Commissioner McCone, a former FBI director, was sent to the epicenter, to Watts, to address what was happening, what caused the 1965 uprisings. And this, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The, the McCone Commission report highlights that, yes, police brutality is a big issue, what sparked the uprisings was an encounter between a, a black male youth and a police officer that led to police brutality. And so, yes, we need to address um, diversifying law enforcement. Uh, we now have a, a, a LAPD commissioner's board um, and really begin to think about community police um, partnerships. But what he highlighted was the issues are much larger. If we don't address these underlying issues, we will have another uprising. Basic social determinants of health, access to employment, access to quality education, affordability of goods and services, um, access to affordable health care. Folks have to travel out to access um, health care services, affordable housing, and a development of, of poor leadership. And he warned folks, if we do not address this, we will have another uprising. And in 1992, South LA, including Watts, um, experienced the 1992 uprisings. So understanding this, we went back to the drawing board and we created a partnership with the local partners that, um, that I, 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 the story I shared with you all on bringing partners and serving Watts. We wanted to ask them, what are the neighborhood priorities? Has anything been addressed since 1965? What are the lived experiences in the neighborhood? And only the folks that are serving the neighborhood would understand that. And so um, the folks that, that the nonprofit partners, faith-based organizations and our local city council came together and said, you know what, let's design a neighborhood assessment. Cynthia, let's take from what you developed and let's, let's ask residents what their priorities are. And it became a community academic and government partnership where our local city council had the resources to convene folks while the uh, community partners had the understanding of what was going on on the ground in the neighborhood, and the academic partners sort of understood the framework and the methodology to begin to ask questions. Um, we co-designed the survey, met one-on-one -on -one with the community leaders to ask questions that they were interested on, in. We did a census profile of Watts. I, um, we did a census profile of Watts using uh, um, ACS and labor stats. And interesting story, we presented labor stats data on unemployment rates in Watts. And according to labor stats data, unemployment rates in Watts is comparable to the U.S. and the city, uh, the state and the city. Um, you know, so technically you would think there's 
there's nothing significant about addressing employment in Watts. When we shared that with partners, they were upset. They said, that's not true. Most of the folks that we served are unemployed. You, th that data is, is wrong and we have to prove that that's wrong. Um, that was a really, really long um, time and space um, in doing that work with them. And what ended up happening that we learned was that actually labor stats data only includes folks that qualify to be part of the labor force. That is, if you were fired from a job or you got let go, you're part of, you know, uh, looking for, for work, but ended up being long-term unemployed because you couldn't find um, work, you're no longer part of that, those numbers. And if you've been formerly incarcerated, you're not considered in those numbers. And so those two were, were a good number of the folks that were part, that live in the neighborhood. And so that's why the numbers did not match. Um, actually, when we, when we did our first neighborhood assessment, 30% of the respondents were unemployed. Um, and that was twice as much as um, what labor stats data was reporting. What we also did was that um, we had a survey we designed with our community partners and our local city council, but we didn't have the staff or, or um, the funds to actually administer the survey. And so again, I mentioned what an asset in the neighborhood is that we're, we're quite young. So the city had a summer youth employment program where youth got paid to do um, work with whatever partner um, the city had. And so we actually partnered with the city to create the Young Ethnographers Program. We trained youth from Watts to administer their surveys. They learned about CDPR, they you know, did their city um, certification, they um, learned the history of their neighborhood, we did capacity building workshops, like how to open up a bank account, how, how to write an abstract for, um, for a presentation, they entered the survey data um, and then read the output to recommend their own programs. Following a positive youth development model where um, our youth ended up being thought partners and not um, infantilized, um, in four weeks, we, in our first iteration of the Watts Community Studio, we collected a thousand surveys of residents of Watts. It was um, a population driver approach when we started. Um, um, and through that, we were able to inform recommendations. We are in the third iteration of the Watts Community Studio. The second iteration of it, we actually honed in a little bit more on our map of Watts. Watts is divided into census tracts, and we looked at how many surveys per census tract to, re uh, to represent the neighborhood we needed um, to actually think about reaching everyone and not simply seeking population driver areas. Um, and so, our youth were actually trained in going to you know, every other block, every other door, knocking on doors, talking to residents. Um, I will say our response rate has always been quite great. Residents of Watts are open to talking to folks. Stories that the youth share are, you know, we grow fruit and vegetables and residents were offering mangoes and different, you know, uh, produce that they were growing and water. Um, you know, the survey would take about 30 minutes um, and the longest survey took about three hours. Um, and the reflection that this, the youth were giving were, did you know that we used to have a jazz festival here? Did you know that this is how the park became the park? And you start seeing shifts in the youth. Little did we know that we were creating the program for the youth while also gathering resident perspectives. And then um, the picture you see in the bottom are community leaders, elected officials, different offices of folks looking at the data and thinking with us about what needs to happen uh, uh, to address uh, neighborhood priorities. We compare the, the sort of focus areas that the McCone Commission report um, highlighted and are, are growing our Watts community assessment to think about um, where should we focus. The 2013 version that had a population driver approach um, only had residents prioritize these different areas, areas that our uh, local city council uh, could, could address. Uh, as I shared with you, it's really complicated sort of where Watts sits. Um, anything related to education um, isn't, really, isn't um, uh, it's not a jurisdiction of the city. It's actually our, uh, our, L our LA Unified School District. Um, and so um, it became quite tough to think of, to think about how do we ask questions where we know the proper um, accountability sectors uh, could respond. Um, once we learned that from the 2013 version, the 2018 version where we went door to door, uh, we became a little bit more consumed with well-being, um, 
what are your concerns and how can we unpack those um, related not only to health outcomes, but also the, the infrastructure to the point where we're understanding that a lot of dumping is happening in the neighborhood, but not by the residents. Folks are coming in outside of the neighborhood and dumping in the neighborhood. Um, there are uh, streets without sidewalks. Um, we also ask residents, where do they go for access to food and services? And so now we have a more uh, a, a larger understanding of how to address uh, community priorities where folks convene. Um, and that has informed, um, I'll share a little bit more of uh, some of the projects that we've been doing as a result of this. Um, so that's that's sort of our, our community-based participatory research effort. We're in the third version of the, the Watts Community Studio um, in, in partnership with a collaborative we created um, in the community. And that collaborative facilitates a collective impact model. So this is another framework we're using now where um, we're bringing in a diverse set of organizations uh, that um, have their own respective vision, but coming together aligns one common vision. Um, that's essentially what collective impact means. We're coming together as a collective to really have uh, productive outcomes um, through an aligned vision. And so five core conditions of collective impact models require sort of one organization that convenes um, that we call the backbone organization. And then we all have a common agenda. We agree on, on a shared um, outcomes for measurement. Uh, we uh, agree also to the activities that the collective um, will be involved with and have consistent communication and engagement with each other. It does require a centralized infrastructure. So that backbone organization that can carry the collective a dedicated staff that shows up to meetings and uh, um, implements the projects that we agree to facilitate and, a, and really have a structure and a process associated to that. So I, I will share for Watts, it's been really, really difficult um, to find funding opportunities that really improve the infra infrastructure of the neighborhood. Residents um, were often left out of large scale multi-million dollar grants um, about a decade ago. And we could never arrive at coming together and receiving large scale grants, capacity, opportunities. Um, there's a list of, of challenges that we face to get multi-million dollar grants. But one opportunity presented itself um, through the state of California about eight years ago, no, in 2018. Um, where um, the Transformative Climate Communities Grant grew out of the Strategic Growth Council, SGC, who is responsible for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving environments in, in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. They released the Transformative Climate Communities Grant and asked uh, neighborhoods that were no larger than five square miles to submit a proposal for a $33.25 million infrastructure. It was the time for Watts. We had done so much work on neighborhood assessments, on charrettes, on visioning, on designing what we wanted our neighborhood uh, to be. And um, part of the Transformative Climate Communities Grant was we need this to be community informed, data driven. We want residents to decide what their projects would be. And the North Star would be improving environmental health uh, public health and uh, preventing displacement. And as a result of that, the Watts Rising Collaborative came. Uh, we used uh, data from the Watts Community Studio and our archive of community workshops and also created our own roadshow to hear from residents about how we wanted to facilitate this effort. And the Watts Rising Collaborative informed by a collective action model grew. Uh, we are now, uh, we've, uh, since our um, the, uh, 2019 announcement that we were funded, um, we've also received a Choice Neighborhood Implementation $35 million grant. And I think we're at $120 million on infrastructure improvements in the neighborhood. Uh, whenever you're in LA, I invite you to see sort of the uh, historical present of how the neighborhood has definitely shifted. Our Jordan Downs, um, public housing site is being redeveloped. Um, we have a brand new shopping center where the uh, local businesses have also have been uh, a decision by community. Uh, we had meetings where folks decided what businesses they wanted to bring in into the shopping center. We're adding parks, we're adding community spaces and uh, demolishing 
all of the units to uh, brand new units um, and they're phasing out. So no one's getting pushed out. Uh, the housing authority purchased one empty lot, started building there and are moving families slowly. So they're phasing out the construction. And right now you see the night and day of sort of the, um, the old buildings that look very much like prisons. Um, uh, we also open up the first complete street in Watts for the city of LA, where we have access to mobility, bicycle lanes, walk, uh, pedestrian walkways, um, uh, uh, bus stops, um, uh, transit for cars. Um, and so uh, we actually opened up the Jordan Downs, rather the, the public housing site, rather than isolating it in its own, so you can actually drive through it. Um, but the Watts Rising Collaborative, um, uh, the Housing Authority decided to be that backbone organization um, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of the City of LA. Um, and they, they came together um, to facilitate a conversation with uh, partners on how, what do we wanna do for this grant? What are the projects that we wanna facilitate? And 18 projects were born out of it from installing uh, free solar panels to homeowners who live in the neighborhood to access to parks, to um, uh, um, electrifying our public transit uh, dash uh, bus. Um, we have uh, about three urban farms. We're uh, changing asphalt in our, our local schools and cooling our schools. Um, most of our schools are just concrete without very much green space. Um, another thing in the neighborhood is that um, in order, we, we tend to have a helicopter surveilling the neighborhood day in and day out. And, and trees kept from being able to see. And so um, South LA Watts are known as concrete jungles uh, because we don't have a lot of access to green space. Um, and what the Watts Rising Collaborative is doing with our tree planting partners, uh, we, we've done an assessment of the neighborhood and we're planting 4,000 trees across the neighborhood. Um, and so folks are getting access to fruit trees, shade trees, um, are taught how to plant them in their, in their, in their homes. And we're also using public um, spaces, um, looking at sidewalks and what types of trees we want to, uh, to have there. So those are some of the, the implementation projects we have. But this, this framework um, um, following a collective impact model is um, that we have a community advisory board that really uh, is informed of what, where the projects are, what are we doing, um, a transparent budget budgeting process. And so um, we report to them every month. Um, how we're doing with our projects. Um, and and then all of our 18 projects, plus um, additional projects we have through other funding mechanisms, what we call leverage projects, all sit within one of these implementation hubs. Um, because the the initial vision of, of Watts Rising as a response to the Strategic Growth Council was about uh, uh, environmental justice. Um, our hubs are focused on um, uh, climate action um, and environmental justice approaches. And so each of these hubs meet regularly, give updates to each other and find avenues to collaborate. Um, the grant uh, um, is a reimbursement grant where the housing authority receives the funds and then uh, gives them into the, their respective organizations meeting the different projects. Um, challenges there are capacity for reporting, for being able to upfront the money. And so we find avenues to support from our largest to our smallest nonprofit. And then our engagement partners are those that are not um, essentially receiving funds to implement the projects, but really service our residents and inform our residents of the opportunities to you know, retrofit their homes, to have solar panels, to engage in feedback on our local parks. And all of this um, then enables folks to access the resources and opportunities that Watts Rising is providing. Um, through our implementation resources, we have different working groups to ensure that we actualize our projects. So um, from a city oversight working group where if there's any approvals or permitting that we need, we call the appropriate entities that uh, facilitate those approvals to understand what the submission is going to look like um, and advise our partners on how to move through the permitting process. Uh, our workforce development working group is that um, uh, Watts Rising aims to hire locally. Um, for our Jordan Downs redevelopment, I believe we have like a 70% local hire of folks. And so getting folks to the jobs at these projects are uplifting. Our tree planting, we actually want to have an urban forestry program where um, 
our, our partners are the ones learning about urban forestry and using the green industry as a future training opportunity for um, the emerging um, workforce there. Um, our community engagement working group advises on how to do community engagement and what. These are local residents who are contracted um, to you know, share uh, the work of Watts Rising. Uh, we call them our, our, our community engagement street team um, and they attend uh, events from our engagement partners to um, different fairs that happen in the neighborhood and really are the experts in letting us know, are you doing community engagement right or not? Um, our data working group um, is sort of where I sit in that we, uh, we facilitate the Watts Community Studio. We ask residents, are you, are, is Watts Rising doing what it's intended to do? Do you know what Watts Rising is? Is it addressing these areas that are relevant to you? Um, and what, do you, what else do you wanna see? And it's sort of an accountability check um, for the collaborative. Um, any other research projects or proposals are also presented in the data working group um, to advise on effective ethical uh, community engaged strategies. Um, and then um, uh, anti-displacement work happens in that we're, these these grants are infrastructure grants. We're improving how our neighborhood looks, but what does that mean for the people that live in the neighborhood? So all of the all of the projects are required to have a displacement avoidance plan. Um, and we also have a partner that does tenants rights um, and displacement avoidance programming. Uh, we're rec recently looking at how, um, how policy uh, can influence access to housing for the redevelopment and are looking at getting folks in Watts to actually benefit from the construction of housing in Watts. Um, and so the anti-displacement working group facilitates that. The tech and design working group helps us more in messaging, um, our logo, um, our, our sort of marketing and communications efforts. Um, with all of that, we center on making sure that the residents are actively engaging and giving us feedback in this work um, to address our major areas, reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions and improve our environment, ensure economic development to, through workforce development, uh, improve uh, public health outcomes considering the um, uh, health inequities, uh, facilitate uh, participatory engagement, which we know improves well-being. Um, and create displacement avoidance planning um, that is inclusive of the people that currently live in the neighborhood to benefit from what's, what, what's coming. Um, and um, all through data informed decision making. Um, so that's essentially how we followed a collective impact model through Watts Rising and um, we're, still, um, we're still going. Uh, we're finishing up uh, this, the Transformative Climate Communities Grant this year. COVID was definitely one of the largest um, challenges we faced in the neighborhood. Um, and with the collaborative, we are in-person folks. Uh, our, our reach of, of residents is often flyers, uh, community events, churches, um, in-person events. And um, through COVID, it, um, we had to shift and think about building capacity on access to technology, access um, to Wi-Fi, learning how to use Zoom, the different virtual platforms, and really think, uh, really learning about the disparate access um, in the neighborhood um, during COVID. And then we actually just shifted to food distribution and immediate like survival mode. Um, a lot of the residents use Watts as an acronym. We are taught to survive. Um, and I will say um, uh, that that gives me a, a reactive reaction to it, largely because folks shouldn't be taught to survive, but really to thrive. And what's causing us to be in survival mode um, is sort of what we need to address. Dr. Gonzalez, now, we have about three minutes until we have to transition out of this session into the next one. Oh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> um, as, I, as I mentioned to Izzy, I can talk about this um, for so long. This is the final sort of um, uh, model I wanted to introduce to you all, the um, engagement spectrum. Oftentimes when we think about engagement, we say, here's a flyer. You should show, you know, you should show up to this event. You should fill out the survey. You should come to this clinical trial, um, and that's as much as we do. And and uh, and and that doesn't really enable engagement. So from outreach to shared leadership, there's an entire spectrum. Um, we can we can consult folks. We can involve them. We can collaborate with them. And so it's really important to understand that. Um, I shared the Watts Community Studio, the work with Watts Rising, um, to share some of the work that I've done sort of in thinking about how do we have shared leadership and thought partnership in the work 
through a common vision. However, we sit within an institution and institutional changes are essential um, to being able to do the work. Um, and I'll share to, um, work from two of the institutions that I work with, but to get to a collaborative and shared leadership space requires an institutional commitment. Um, there's an important value of the difference between performative and transformative um, engagement. We can check a box easily and say, we work with community because we shared this flyer, we got a letter of support, but the transformative piece is getting to that shared leadership space. And so um, I'll, I'll share a bit about Charles Drew University. Integral to Charles Drew University is community engagement, is working with the folks that surround it. Drew is actually across the street from Watson, the Willowbrook neighborhood that I mentioned to you all. And it's, it, it's, it came out of the 1965 uprisings really to begin to address uh, the limited access to um, clinicians of color um, and, and, and proper access to care. Um, and with that, Drew has grown to ensure that its curricular experience engages community engagement principles, social justice concepts. So across the, the CDU curriculum, we call it a unique advantage where our students will have research experience that is rooted in social justice um, and equity-minded approaches, while also thinking about the local and the global. In our public health program, our students actually learn about the Cuban health model and go to Cuba to learn about prevention and in public health and think about what does that look like when serving South LA. We also designed, um, in partnership with Dr. Loretta Jones, um, one of the, the uh, the folks that led the community faculty model. She said, you know what, folks in the community are PhDs of the sidewalk. We have knowledge, we have expertise. And so what we need to do is collaborate and have a faculty appointment at the university for these expert leaders. And community faculty emerge where we identify local leaders in the community, give them a, a faculty appointment, and then they partner with local researchers, with students, um, and really think about knowledge production within the context of how does it have a community benefit to it. <laughs> and these are some of the ways in which there, there needed to be an institutional alignment for CDU to say, yes, we, we will have a faculty appointment, we will have a track, and we'll, we'll find avenues to support our community faculty. We also created a capacity building curriculum for our, our community faculty to understand academia and the language that sits there. And then also created that for our academic partners to understand how to work with community, all led through our community faculty. They also sit on our various boards, including the IRB, to review proposals and consider uh, community in that. Of the many hats I wear, I also lead a PhD program in community partnered policy um, at the uh, Rand uh, Party Graduate School. Um, and, and really what, what we've done here is also an, a, a significant institutional shift, recognizing that yes, there's a core of policy education that folks need to have. And then there's focus areas um, that um, students can get into, either our traditional research analysis and design, or really thinking about emerging technologies and its, and its implications on policy. The one that I lead is the community partnered policy and action stream where our students involve following a CDPR model, involve community partners in their dissertation projects and builds capacity in how uh, community partnership is essential for policy development. And really the knowledge production should move beyond recommendations and sit into action through dissemination and implementation science. And they do this through their courses, through on the job training opportunities um, and requirements for their dissertation where they need to have a community partner as part of their dissertation committee. So with that, um, I hope you all um, uh, have taken an understanding that not all models fit everyone, but an understanding of that is really important to begin to think about you know, what works. So as much as you know, this image, everyone uh, needs a bike, um, that could be the framework but the understanding of how the bike should look like is very specific to understanding the respective needs and assets of that particular population. Same thing goes for neighborhoods. Folks aren't asking to be re rich or wealthy, but um, we've understood that at baseline, um, communities are often not accessing basic uh, needs for a quality and just life. And so this work needs to be very intentional. It is overwhelming. It is it requires a lot of work and a lot of time. And often um, uh, there's this assumption that it's not rigorous, 
Um, but the literature will show you that it's um, it shows to be even more rigorous because of the time and intentionality needed and the considerations that are required to be able to do the work. Otherwise, um, we sit in a reality where we're just digging folks deeper into the issues rather than actually beginning to take action and moving towards action um, to make uh, to address the the real issues in real time in our communities. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, and thanks, y'all, for your time. I'm open to discussion now. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was phenomenal. Um, we've hit, hit the top of the hour, so we lost a few folks, but I do want to invite the folks that are here to unmute, unmute your video. Um, we're in the extended Q&A session with uh, Dr. Gonzalez. I'm going to remove your spotlight so you look the same to everybody. And um, I guess I'll start with a question. I see you took a sip of water. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have so many questions. I guess thinking about the successes that you've had with the Watts Community Studio and with the Watts Rising Initiative, it's clear that some of that was funded because you built these relationships with community, with government. And it feels like that work is so um, structurally sort of in opposition to what we do in academia. And I'm curious if you can talk about, is there a space where these can come together, where we can create what feels like transferable knowledge, but also do some of this sort of structural work? It just, they seem like different worlds, but you're bridging them both. So like, how do we... How do we well, they, kind of bring them together? They are different worlds, I would say. <laughs> um, storyteller by nature. Um, I didn't know I was going to partner with government. So already living where I lived, um, we were, a, my, my, my parents are, they, they, they don't go outside of the lines, right? They, they follow rules and they don't want to encounter any issues. I think that's a sort of a trauma, right? That we've we've all um, we've all sort of experienced, and so I was disillusioned by government when I started looking at my dissertation um, work. And at some point, I needed funding, and so I set out to find funding. And it, there was an alignment. Our local city council um, uh, person, he had just been elected into office, and he ran under sort of this this motto, if you're gonna evaluate what I do, evaluate what I do in Watts. So he had this intentionality of, of wanting to do work in Watts. Um, and I remember when I first met with his staff, they asked like, how do we help? What do we do? We really like what you're proposing. And I said, I don't need you. I just need your money. Like you've been so <laughs> bad to our community and I, you'll see I'm very transparent. And so, um, yeah, so I, I let them know that like, you know, um, I got this. And in fact, I learned so much. Um, they said, well, hopefully like in our partnership, you get to see a little bit more of what we are. And I, I definitely see as a structure and a system, it's not designed to help communities like Watts. Um, and that's unfortunate on so many levels. But one of the things is, is that asset mapping, right? So mm -hmm. you and your work, whoever you want your partner to be, you, you like, I don't think I could have accessed the nonprofits and the key leaders had I not worked with government. Because okay. those are the folks that consistently serve, right? Like our nonprofits, like here, they they tend to go to our local city council. They they connect with with elected officials because those those end up being these they end up being the funders for their service, right? And so they they have those relationships. In academia, we don't tend to have those relationships, and so being able to work with our local city council enabled me to connect with all of these key leaders. Um, and then there, um, they had like a doer's lunch with our local city council. So all these key leaders would show up and just update on what they're doing. And I, I'd sit and take notes and just listen and understand these dynamics. Again, on the CBUPR model, what is the context? What are the key players? Mapping all of that. The, the interesting thing, the community engagement spectrum comes from pu uh, public administration. Um, and it moved into public health, we're saying the same things, we're just using a different one. Um, and so um, some of these spaces already exist and figuring out where they're at could be, can be the first approach to starting to enable and building that relationship. 
And again, that's the hard part. Will, is there in academic spaces, is there institutional commitment for researchers to be able to get that time to mm. build those relationships, to understand that, to value that partnership? And, and, and I will say, um, that's how I, like, that's why I ended up in sharing, like the institutional commitment has enabled the opportunity to have, to build these times, to attend these meetings, to build these relationships, because there's an intentionality of wanting to work um, through a transformative rather than a performative space. That makes sense. Steven, as I saw you come off video mute, do you want to ask a question? Um, I got maybe a very specific question kind of brewing in my head i you were, first of all thanks so much for your talk super super enlightening and helpful to yeah think about how we can really engage with communities in our work um something you said sparked my interest about the the funding and and how um at least with watts rising there was kind of a reimbursement model and so i took that to mean that uh these partner organizations had to do the work and then get paid later yeah. um and so I, I've been thinking about those kinds of dynamics and I was just wondering if you had any details or tips and tricks to think about how to navigate that and how to, um, yeah, how to use funds in a supportive way. Yeah. So I am, I was part of the folks that, that designed Watts Rising and sometimes for some time I actually led it out of the housing authority. My biggest lesson was that implementation part as a researcher, you know, I would say residents would, are talking about employment. They want, want jobs. They want jobs. Like the data shows we're highly unemployed. And then having worked at the housing authority, the folks on the ground were like, Cynthia, you're going to learn so much. <laughs> One of those pieces was that access to employment is a whole pipeline. It's a leaky, leaky pipeline from, you know, the access to resources to be able to write your resume, submit it online, access to technology, showing up for an interview, you know, taking the interview, keeping the job, all of that are sort of milestones. Another biggest lesson was about capacity on the reimbursement model. You, we have a vast, like an array of partners, those that, hey, I'm going to submit my report, you know, um, every, every other month, which is sort of the date that the deadlines we gave them. And they were in, ready, done. And then there was the, the other end of the spectrum where it was like, I'm struggling to stay open. I want to serve our residents. I have great intention and can't can't sort of like arrive at, at being able to submit this report, right? So what we ended up doing was there are, again, there are so many resources. I talked to you all about the Summer Youth Employment Program on how we got our young ethnographers. Well, there's also so many capacity building opportunities for folks. So we actually did internships where we had folk, um, sort of folks right out of undergrad or right of a, out of a master's program who have done like climate justice internship. We took interns in and they helped us help the nonprofits, right? And helped us with reporting. And this wasn't coming out of our pocket. We ended up being a partner site to be able to do that. And they were getting paid out of their internship. Um, it's called the Climate Action Corps, one of them. Um, uh, now, a lot of them have actually gotten hired um, and have built the skill sets on, um, you know, management and reporting and the like. Uh, we have um, out of the team, um, the team grew for Watts Rising. And so each of the projects are assigned to a project manager. And so they meet one on one um, and are sort of oftentimes like we hold their hands to be able to get this, these reportings. Um, I will I, I will say it's not perfect. It is so so difficult um but again the partnership piece is what's actually made us move forward in that high need space <laughs> right now we're trying to design a, a training program and get funding for that so that we have nonprofit capacity building again that bi-directional piece not only are, they, are we are we learning about climate justice climate change assessing the projects but we're also trying to build capacity internally in their organizations to um, ensure that if and when we're no longer doing this work, that they're able to manage the organization based on these capacity building curricula. So far, we've done that. And then there's a sort of a leadership institute that also does like an organizational assessment. And we've also worked with them to assist some of the nonprofits. We're still trying to figure out because the needs are very specific to the nonprofit, very vulnerable. Uh, they have to share a lot. 
And so hopefully we, we strengthen that a little bit more, but yeah, you, you caught that real good. Um, it's, that's a really hard, um, uh, what is it? Uh, a, a really difficult space, um, in the partnership. Uh, this what you just said though I think that's a brilliant idea I know you said that it doesn't work perfectly but I feel like because we've encountered similar issues where just jumping through the bureaucratic hoops to get the money is just beyond what the, these organizations or at some point it becomes not worth the money um, exactly. the, and yeah. so building in that capacity building that's built into it um, yeah that's a lot of food for thought for me so I thank you yeah feel free to look at like don't try to reinvent the wheel someone mm -hmm. has invented it um now um actually um our our mayor's office rep really like the um the internship approach so mm -hmm. i think we're working with like four different internship programs um, americorps is one of them right? i was gonna say it sounds like americorps exactly yeah americorps, it sounds like a vista yeah 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 we've had a couple of vistas okay um and then um if you all sort of are in academic institutions like i teach a community engagement course and so their applied learning experience ends up being some of the work we do with watts rising so any of the assessments any of the report we needed to do like a business assessment um and we did it for for my class the students were learning about community engagement and strategies of working with community and ethics and the principles that we were learning in textbooks actually applied um, then we did a report to Watts Rising, and that report ended up assisting them with getting more funding for the local businesses. Um, so our students also become a great asset, um, and it's also bi-directional with them in that they're building their skill sets and learning how to do this work too. Great. I have more questions, but I don't want to monopolize the time. Do any of our other folks have questions? So Cynthia, as you think about not next steps, but I'm thinking about scaling, you know, does this approach that you've taken with Watts, do you envision that this could happen in multiple communities around the US? Is the next step sort of state level initiatives or national initiatives to facilitate the kind of work and infrastructure investment that you've talked about? Like how do we how do we learn from Watts and what you and your teams and community, like what's happened there? Yeah, scaling is always a question. Um, for the for the studio, we've done it in other parts of the city. That's actually okay. how the young ethnographers were born. Um, so again, we can we can do frameworks, but you know, the same exact replica of a project, we can't um, because it, I mean, you said it in the chat. We have similar histories, um, but we're also um, we're also quite distinct in in our experiences and in our in our needs. Um, I, I will call out, um, um, I, I ended up being part of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leaders Program. And there's a lot of folks doing similar work. And now we're building a network um, to understand and learn from each other. So sort of a, a community of learning um, where we're beginning to partner or inform each other's work in that way. Um, not necessarily to replicate our, our efforts, but really begin to think about how we learn from each and every one of our efforts. So, so there's, um, there's that um, sort of on a, on a large scale space, I really, um, I really sit in the Watts space. And what, um, what a lot of folks have said in Watts is we could be a model, right? We can be a model for the ways in which we do work um, um, in other communities. And I, I think that's where we're sitting right now. We're, we're doing the assessment to think about what are the processes? What did we learn? What did we struggle with? Um, and how do we inform that for other communities to really have a framework? Um, but I, I will say, um, residents get really upset because I'm a, I'm a framework person that I, like, that we, they, they laugh at me, like, here comes nerdy Dr. Gonzalez kind of thing. And I don't, <laughs> I, I go by Cynthia, um, in, in the community. Um, and I, I correct them if they ever call me Dr. Gonzalez, because again, that power differential. Right? Sure. Um, and so, um, they, um, they, they don't like to be sat in a framework. Um, when I, when I first spoke, I like, I'm like, we're doing collective impact. No, we're doing our own thing. We're, <laughs> you know, but really like, if we think about like collective impact at a national level, um, president Barack Obama, before he left office, he had promise zone designations. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So like collective impact came out of Stanford. Right. And I think the promise zone designation only elevated the department of ed is all about collective impact, um, at a national level. And so before he left office, different um, communities and neighborhoods 
apply to be designated as a chromosome. Okay. Um, and what that means is that they have to create a, coll- a collaborative, a collective impact model. And how are they going to impact? How are they going to improve the well-being of their respective neighborhoods? How do they understand their neighborhoods? And and then with that, um, they end up applying for federal grants um, and get additional points for being a designee. Um, and so that elevates their uh, their funding opportunities. And so really elevating the framework and seeing how it fits in the respective communities, I think is really, really incredibly valuable. Same thing with CBPR. Um, I, I will say a youth engagement model using um, positive youth development is nothing new. The literature shows positive youth development models are incredible in terms of developing youth. And I think it's just really looking at how these frameworks fit into our respective work and our respective population. And then create a, a, a community of knowledge that that shares how we learn in our own in our our, our own ways. And Stephen asked about, uh, you know, nonprofit capacity building. It may look different in terms of our own the organizations we work with, but really thinking about how to elevate the capacity is, is, is something just you know textbook. Um, yeah. So thinking about one of your frameworks and thinking about context, that will shift over time as communities naturally shift over time. So in your mind, is there an interval at which you go back and you do sort of a formal reassessment? Like say your community partners have changed, maybe one folded and two new have come up and the demographics have changed and sort of, when do you decide to kind of revisit that and figure out if you need to um, you know, fundamentally adjust something that's happening? Yeah, um, that that's great. You know, I think because I've sat and watched my whole life, it's a lot, easier for me to be able to do that. We've done the neighborhood assessment every five years. Um, and the survey has actually looked differently because the partners have shifted or the priorities okay. have shifted. Um, so I think uh, uh, understanding that what's rising alone has changed. There's new staff, new leaders, there's emerging nonprofits coming in, there's folks who are becoming excited about that work. So I think being in intentional communication um, I, I've also realized the more I, I grow in my work, the more distant I become from what's happening on the ground. And that yeah. is, that is so hard, I will say, um, because that's what feeds me like community events and whatnot. Like on Sunday, we just had what we call Cicla Via. Um, and so the city closes streets, um, and it's a mobility space where, you know, we ride our bikes, we walk, we learn from about community resources. It's just a beautiful day in the neighborhood, right? Um, and they tend to be really long stretches of the city. So um, they actually piloted Cicla Mini in Watts. So we had Cicla Mini in Watts on, on, on Sunday. And I, I'm, I'm in sort of my academic hat, like who are the new key players? Who's here? What's changed? Um, and, and it's just, you end up, you end, like, you need to be involved um, consistently and not disconnect to understand what changes are being made or have someone represent, like we have, um, my right-hand person is now um, the one leading the community studio. I think the student has excelled the teacher and she is thriving in that training our youth and working with the with the surveys in the community, um, but always making sure that you consistently show up or have someone show up to understand those shifts. Um, and, and don't over-promise and under-deliver, right? So if, you know, how long will you be working with the community and being very honest about that? Yeah. Um, the hurt is often that we show up and then we leave. Um, but when, you know, when I had my children, I had to be honest with, with folks and saying, you know, I'm going to step back a bit. I'm a mom. It's going to be twins. And so that vulnerability and that ability for folks to say, okay, you know, she stepped back for these reasons and having that consistent communication is essential. But I think you decide depending on how long you think you could be in that community in that space and be being very honest and intentional about how long um, you can commit. That makes sense. All right. I mean, I, I could talk to you for a very long time, but I don't want to monopolize things. Um, do you have any questions for us? Is there any feedback that you want or anything that we can offer you? You've, you've shared so much of your wisdom with us. Yeah. Um, what are you all working on? Um, what interests <laughs> you? Yeah. I mean, I can talk about that. I don't know if I, if anybody else wants to go first. Stephen, you seem to have aligned interests. Yeah, I'm happy to chat. Um, 
anyone else can feel free to jump in. Um, but just really briefly, a um, couple of different lines of research, but the, the two big ones that I'm working on right now are um, working with the city health department on evaluating uh, a new model for accessing uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV, so PrEP for HIV. Um, so they're using the telemedicine model so that folks can have a flexible and convenient way to access PrEP um, that doesn't require coming into a brick and mortar clinic necessarily. Um, so doing an evaluation with them, and that has put me into contact with a lot of different players in the HIV prevention space across Philadelphia and thinking about how to partner with these different organizations to find, as you highlighted, common goals and um, ways to partner to achieve those goals. Um, so that's one kind of area in which I'm thinking about community partnership around. And the other one is a grant that I'm involved in called SEAL, which is the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big national project that has this really specific focus on uh, developing community engagement infrastructure for research. Um, and so that is something I'm just kind of dipping my toes into that and really getting involved in that and realizing that a lot of what you're talking about, like this collective impact framework, like that's got to be central to the, this kind of work. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to soak it in and, and see how, how, you know, we could apply these ideas. Um, and, and that's kind of what was the context in which we were working with community partners. We're doing incredible work and trying to find ways to have mutually beneficial relationships, but realizing that some of the bureaucracy and the, just the red tape and the oh, it's a grant and it's federal money like all of this was becoming <laughs> yeah. a big thing and, and how to okay build systems as a, so that we can navigate that so that's kind of the where my um, thinking has been coming from totally in alignment I, I will say I drew one of the focus research pillars of HIV AIDS um, and so a lot of what's happening there we have a um the NIH Center for AIDS Research um, mm -hmm. has funded um, Drew for a series of, of efforts and projects. Um, Dr. Nina Harawa, I think, is one of the leading experts in, in that work um, and really has, has tapped into community-engaged efforts. Um, Omero Delfino is also another researcher really addressing um, sort of community engagement and really considering community engagement in the context of, of HIV AIDS. Uh, we also have like a a mobile clinic um, where we go to population drivers and get folks tested um, and um, offer education materials and and such. Um, so I know that's that's been one of the, the thriving spaces for the university. Um, so kudos to, kudos to you in that. We we also we, we also have like a, a the Oasis clinic um, um, that that sits in uh, in in thinking about prep um, and sort of messaging around around prep for that as well. Um, but the, the community engagement strategies sit with partnering with communities and uh, um, finding avenues to remove red tape. On COVID, I, I think I sit with that too. I'm thinking about recovery, um, what, what that looks like. I, I don't find us to be in a post-COVID world, um, um, but really thinking about what COVID did in terms of shedding light on the inequities, right? I think I think before COVID, we sat in an abyss where we were yelling about disparities, inequities, injustice, and COVID just came in and shed light to it. Um, and if we didn't learn from that, at least um, there's an opportunity for missed opportunities um, in, in really drawing attention to the fact that um, determinants of health are not isolated, that they sort of inform each other and impact each other on so many levels. Um, we have a stop COVID uh, campaign um, with UCLA. It's an NIH national effort. Um, and one of the pieces that I did there was, um, again, looking at assets, right? Like who were the folks that were working with our communities um, and mental health came up, right? Um, so we we did a like a seminar series for uh, mental health therapists who provided therapy, virtual therapy to their clients during COVID. And what we learned was that one, they just wanted to soak up the information. They didn't get enough information on COVID and their clients were asking them about how, like, what about vaccinations? These were, these were the folks that could easily just have access to the population and we weren't using them as an opportunity. 
Um, and so they said, you know, any chance we get to talk to a clinician about COVID and offer education to our clients, we take it. Um, that was day one, an entire just 101 on COVID. And they asked really significant questions. Day two was a hard one. Day two was like, I told them, like, turning the mirror around. How are you doing? And what ended up happening was that they said, we have no time to think about us. Like, the needs only elevated. The needs only got higher. And so now we're trying to think about working with the Department of Mental Health to do sort of self-care or, like, requirements for them to actually get opportunities to unpack um, and think more about that work because they end up being a great thought partner and thinking about how to address the impacts of COVID um, and sort of the highlight of how uh, disparities only got wider. Um, but they themselves are, are, are needing some support. Um, so I hear you on that. Um, on, so, but the partnership piece is, is, is oftentimes just thinking about where do they sit and where do they work? I think working with local city government is essential and what you're doing, um, they convene a lot of folks. Um, in LA County, DHS has an entire community partnership effort. Um, um, they're the ones that worked on on uh, vaccination um, and reaching our community partners. Um, so I think you're you're in the right headspace. Collective impact is hard. The Collective Impact Forum, just FYI, has like conferences and resources available to learn a little bit more about collective impact. On paper, it's incredible. Um, in application, like most efforts, is incredibly tough. Finding a backbone institution that can upfront money on a reimbursement model is quite tough. And I think that's where local government sits, right? That they they can do that. Um, so the housing authority being able to do the 33.25 mil over time and do the reporting um, was essential for Watts Rising to initiate this collaborative. Um, and now we've been able to apply for multiple grants. Um, um, yeah, and doing quite well in sustaining the collaborative as a result. For us, I mean, as Izzy alluded to, I wear multiple hats, but <laughs> thinking about the center director hat, um, really focused on building capacity and implementation science. And it's across a number of different areas, but some key focal points for us are with our CIFAR, the Center for AIDS Research. We have um, what was a working group on implementation science, and it's now transitioned into a core for the CIFAR. So really trying to grow the workforce of folks that do HIV and AIDS related work, both domestically and globally, who understand implementation science and feel like they can use those principles in their own work, including community-based and community-engaged participatory research. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work around maternal health, an increasing footprint in environmental health, but it's, it's just starting. Um, there's an investigator here named Gina South who does work around structural racism and also greening the community. And I'm working with her on some projects too to figure out how to implement the things that she is, the interventions that she's using to improve health, sort of neighborhood-based community health. That's that's the tough part. And I, I think getting down into the weeds of that, right? Um, for me, when, when talking, um, it's hard to elevate the social justice transformative piece, like really calling the inequities what they are, right? Mm -hmm. Either sexes or races or inter, you know, interism here, right? But really using academia as a tool to call truth to power, right? I, oftentimes we, we want to, um, under the guise of objectivity, um, we avoid um, these difficult conversations about power differentials and equities of unjust history. Um, and we wanna you know, erase that and disconnect from it. And I think um, recognizing that you, you mentioning structural racism really just push that button in, in calling attention to that, right? Um, proposals and, and interventions and the like um, are quite helpful, right? Knowledge production is important. Um, however, elevating it would require an intentional practice of understanding how inequities and injustice uh, operate in our current systems and the, the shifts that need that need to happen accordingly. So just really thinking about the, the center and how you all are doing that sounds, sounds great. Um, yeah. It, it's a task. It is a task. And I think another thing that I think about a lot um, as senior faculty, which seems weird to say, but that's where I am, is trying to protect more early stage faculty 
because when you are at a very old, very storied institution that has a way of doing things and you come in and you start talking about isms, sometimes people get really uncomfortable. And so one of the things that I think about is as we're creating this capacity, um, making sure that folks are, are professionally not at risk. Right. Right. Um, oh, that's, that's, yeah. Um, not being seen as that angry person of color, or angry, insert minoritized uh, identity here mm -hmm. um, is, is tough to navigate, right? Um, in, in an institution that, in a, in a system that um, was designed um, to not have those conversations. Um, but I think, I think, it, I think that's why I start with the lived experience conversation. How does that inform our own positionality reflecting on why is it that we're interested in this work and why do we see the lens in which we see? Sure. Um, I, I do know my lens are highly informed um, by a black liberation movement. I grew up in Watts when it was predominantly black. Um, a lot of my pedagogy is about allyship with black communities. Um, and so when I speak, I have to share that. I can't be disconnected from that. But I'm also um, a daughter of immigrants um, and you know, can understand struggles as a result of that experience. Um, with all of that said, like I think integrating reflective um, opportunities for researchers is in, in essential in doing this work. Why is it that you're interested in this work? Why do you understand your analysis or your approach in, in this way um, will just transform the ways in which we do research significantly. Um, being, I don't think as an anthropologist, we can't be disconnected from the work. That's why we have to understand why is it that we're so committed to it? What, what sparks that interest? Um, and that I think opens up opportunities to do more real-time intentional work, for sure. It's wonderful. Well, I, I think it's probably time to draw us to a close. Um, we have tremendously benefited from your wisdom and from your sharing your experiences, and I am, am deeply grateful to you. We have recorded the session. We will check in with you before we post anything, but um, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you all. Feel free to reach out. Um, thank you for the time and space. Thanks for letting me share about my lovely and wonderful neighborhood uh, with you all um, and how we're trying to figure it out here. More power to the, to the work. Thanks, y'all. Wonderful. Have a great day. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez.